Well, hello, and thank you all for coming. Our partners and donors and supporters here in the offices of Columbia Land Trust and White Salmon, Washington, and all of you Oak enthusiasts online. My name is Lindsay Cornelius, and I'm the manager of the East Cascades Oak Partnership for Columbia Land Trust, or ECOP for short. And we've invited Doug Tallamy to talk with us today as a way of celebrating an incredible year for oak conservation in the East Cascades. So I'll give you a brief overview of the partnership in a moment, but first I wanna let those of you online know that you are muted. So you'll need to share your question and observations in the Q&A. And we'll invite Doug to answer as many of our questions as he can after his presentation. Those of you in the room here with me will be able to ask questions directly of Doug. Um, after his presentation. For those of you who aren't familiar with the East Cascades Oak Partnership, we're an organically grown collaborative of tribal, federal, state, and local organizations, small businesses, private landowners, and oak enthusiasts, more than 225 of us representing 25 different organizations. And we're all implementing a strategic plan for oak conservation in the East Cascades. Columbia Land Trust is the fiscal and administrative sponsor of the partnership. Um, so we're investing deeply in ECOP as part of our mission work to conserve and care for the lands, waters, and wildlife of the Columbia River region through sound science and strong relationships. And the work of the partnership in many ways is a manifestation of our conservation agenda, which seeks to accomplish land conservation, as well as to promote a culture of stewardship. The East Cascades, as its name suggests, is east of the Cascade Mountain Range, but the climate here, which one would expect to be cold and dry, is moderated by this great plume of moist, warm air flowing through the Columbia River Gorge, allowing a Mediterranean plant like Oregon white oak to grow and thrive. Um, along with steep precipitation and elevation gradients, our oaks occupy a wide variety of soil types, aspects, elevations, uh, and grow in association with a wide diversity of plant and animal species, creating two of the most important characteristics of our region, exceptional biodiversity and high predicted climate resilience. Uh, with relatively low levels of existing habitat fragmentation, but a great deal of person oak interactions were in a unique and powerful position to conserve and steward these oak systems in a way that promotes those important qualities. Uh, Doug Tallamy, our guest this afternoon and the author of several books, including most recently The Nature of Oaks, writes beautifully about that diversity of life that relies on our native oak species, but also about the power we each have to promote that diversity in our own backyards. <laughs> Doug is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he's authored 96 research papers, and if his books are any indication, turned countless students into passionate entomologists. That is one of my favorite things about his writing. He makes science accessible. He turns your observations of nature into credible sources of information, science you can literally touch wherever you are. And he presents compelling evidence and some very simple but powerful solutions to this mass extinction event we find ourselves in the middle of. So without any more rambling for me, let's welcome Doug and thank you all for being here. Well, thank you, Lindsay. That was very nice rambling. I could, I could listen to that for a while. Uh -huh. um, all right, I wanna, I wanna talk about the nature of oaks, meaning the species that are associated with oaks. I'll do the best I can to make it nationwide. <clears throat> but of course I live in the East, so most of my examples are actually from my yard. Uh, but much of what I talk about in my yard actually occurs in the, the West as well. But before we do that, uh, let me remind you that it is insects that are the little things that run the world. And E.O. Wilson told us that uh, way back in 1987. But there's a problem, and that is we're losing our insects. We've already lost at least 45% of the insects on, on planet Earth. Uh, and, and we're doing it because we're killing them. Lights kill insects. Got a lot of lights out there. Neonicotinoids kill insects. And all the light green there are areas where we're using a lot of neonicotinoids. Deforestation kills insects, cars kill insects, climate change kills insects. When you take an area like this and you turn it into that, it kills insects. What does that have to do with oaks? Well, there's no better way to share our spaces with insects, with nature in general, than to plant an oak. And that's what I wanna talk about today. Uh, I'm gonna to talk about the oaks that we have put on our property here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. We moved into a 10 acre lot 
of a farm that was broken up in the year 2000. Um, <clears throat> it was a very old farm, been farmed for uh, almost 300 years. Uh, but the last thing they did was mow it for hay. And then three years before we actually moved, they took it out of mowing. And when you mow for hay in this part of the world, you're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants from, from Asia. So when they stopped mowing, this is what our property looked like. All of this, this Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and all these other things. That's what the 10 acres looked like. So our first job uh, in terms of restoring this property was to get rid of that. Uh, and that's what my wife Cindy's doing right here. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, they look at a big invasion and, and they just throw up their hands and I don't blame them. It is a lot of work, but Cindy has proven that you can do it. She did it pretty much on her own, takes constant vigilance because they keep wanting to come back, but you've got to get rid of these, these nasty guys before you plant that, that oak. Um, well, down the street, about a mile and a half, there are two big white oaks that dropped their acorns that first year that we moved in. Uh, and so I grabbed some of those acorns and I simply planted them. White oaks, the entire white oak group germinates in the fall and they send down a, a root, a radical, uh, and that's all they do in the fall. And then in the spring, they send up their first leaves and that's all they do in the spring and pretty much the summer. And it gives it gives oaks the impression, gives people the impression that oaks grow really slowly. Um, well, it appears they're growing slowly, but that first year they're actually growing underground very quickly. Oaks grow 10 times more root biomass than leaf biomass in their first year. So here's the oak that, that uh, one of the oaks that I planted from an acorn. It's got a little deer cage around it. And in the neck of the woods, if you don't put a deer cage around your oak, you don't have an oak. And that's one of the major problems they're facing. <clears throat> and this is what it looked like 18 years later, 45 feet tall, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it didn't take that long for it to become a real landscape tree. So one of the things I want to stress today is that oaks are a, a lifeline to uh, a countless number of, of creatures. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks in various ways. Uh, mammals as well, many rodents, but the big guys too, uh, black bears, raccoons, possums, uh, and others. Not that many reptiles depend on oaks, but there are several species of butterflies that are specialist on oaks and hundreds of species of moths depend on them as well. Um, including their predators and parasitoids. It's a big complex community. Cynipid gall wasps are associated with, with oaks. All of the galls you see on oaks come from cynipid gall wasps. Many beetles, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, many weevils, uh, all depend on oaks. Then if you look under the tree, you've got lots of spiders. You've got dozens more species of arthropods, mollusks, and annelids that are depending on oak leaf litter. So a very complex community, diverse web of life. The problem is, most people don't know that. It goes unnoticed, and if it's unnoticed, it's unappreciated. And that's why I wrote The Nature of, of Oaks. It is a month-by-month -month guide to the life that occurs on uh, the oaks in your area. The goal was to provide the knowledge that generates interest, uh, and interest often leads to compassion. And I think we need a lot more compassion towards the natural world these days. So first, a few facts about the genus Quercus. It contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. Uh, there are 200 species of oaks in Mexico alone. So uh, in terms of a woody plant, it's a large genus. The word Quercus comes from uh, the Celtic quer, meaning fine, and quez, meaning tree. And oaks are indeed fine trees. There are four major taxonomic sections in the genus. Uh, in North America, and you've, you've heard uh, about some of these. The white oak group, for example, is called Quercus. The red oak group, Lobate. The live oak group, Varentes. And a much smaller canyon oak group, Protobalanus in the West. This is the distribution of, of oaks. There is at least one oak species in every place except the brown areas. Um, so here are your East Cascades uh, over here, I guess. Um, and you've got your Oregon white oak there. But uh, the center of distribution for oaks in North America is the Southeast. But again, uh, an awful lot of oaks in, in Mexico. I think there's 38 species in, in California alone. So there are a lot of oaks pretty much everywhere except the high mountains and the very uh, high, high plains. Oaks live a lot longer than people think. Average lifespan is 900 years. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, and 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods of growth, they're delivering unique ecosystem services. Uh, now, many of our oaks don't live that long, and it's typically because of something we have done to them. We'll talk about that as well. 
what's the oldest oak in, in the uh, country? It's probably p- the Penchenka oak uh, in California, a coastal live oak. It's somewhere around 2000 years old. But if you really want the oldest oak, you've got to go to the uh, low uh, ground hugging species like the Palmer oak, uh, again in California. Um, they, they root in one area, then they grow very slowly along the ground, then they root in another area. This part dies and this one keeps going. This specimen has been estimated at 13,000 years old, some of the oldest living things on the planet. Oaks can get big. This is the Y oak in Y, Maryland. It was the largest white oak in, in the country. Fell over, boy, it's probably been 20 years now in a hurricane. I did get to see it before it fell over, but it was a, a big fella. Uh, But another point I want to make today is that not all oaks are large. There are some small species. So uh, in in appropriate areas around the country, you can put an oak in a small yard if you pick the right species. And finally, they have superior um, function, superior ecological function. They have the highest biodiversity value, meaning they are supporting more species than any other tree genus. Um, They're sequestering more carbon dioxide than almost any other other tree. Of course, they're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, locking the tissue, the carbon up in their tissues. Uh, But then um, equally important, they're pumping carbon into the ground through their root systems. And once it's in the ground, uh, it is stable. It can stay there for thousands of years. That's, of course, why our soils are brown or black. It's because the plant roots have put the carbon in the soil. So very important ecosystem service. Oaks are uh, some of the best soil stabilizers because of their huge root systems. They make the best leaf litter, meaning it lasts the longest. A single uh, oak leaf can take up to three years to break down, which means it gets to do its job as uh, part of the leaf litter community longer than other other, uh, tree species. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. I started the book in October. People always say, why did you start in October? I started in October because that's when my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about oaks. And it was October. And I looked out the window and there's our oak. Uh, And of course, October is when the thing that you notice about oaks, of course, is the acorns that they uh, are are dropping. And a single oak can make a lot of acorns, up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And each one of them is a, a very rich package of food. It's very high in fat, very high in protein. And a number of animals depend on uh, the, the fat and protein in oaks in the fall. Um, certainly those, those rodents, I don't want to stress that too much. People don't like rodents, but they, they need those acorns. Uh, but the big guys do as well. Uh, bears are putting on layers and layers of fat by eating as many acorns as they can when we allow those oaks to mast and leave those acorns on the ground. Uh, coons eat, eat acorns. Um, squirrels, of course, eat acorns. Those cute deer eat lots of acorns. A number of birds depend on them as well, including turkeys. Now, I know you don't, you're not supposed to have turkeys in the West. I think we introduced them. You, you might have them, but um, they walk around the woods eating as many acorns as they can for the same reason. They put on a fat layer and get them through the winter. But other birds as well, red belly woodpeckers, titmice, towhees, uh, nuthatches, flickers, many ducks. Uh, depend on acorns in the fall, particularly wood ducks. They really love them. When an acorn, when a viable acorn falls in the water, it sinks. Uh, So the ducks dive down and they eat as many as they can, or they come right up on the shore and and pick off those those acorns. Then there's a number of invertebrates that depend on acorns, like the acorn weevil. This is an acorn weevil larva tunneling out of an acorn, and that's what the adult looks like. They can be really common in in acorns. And this is a, a group of moths called acorn moths, a number of species, they look so similar, we need DNA to separate them, but the caterpillar develops in acorns and then tunnels out just like the acorn weevil, and that's what the moth looks like. <clears throat> so you have all these things using acorns, and the populations of these acorn eaters can be quite high. If you look under a, a tree just a week or two after they drop, it drops its acorns, it's utter destruction. There's, it's very hard to find a viable acorn under there. Um, which means if you're trying to collect acorns, you've got to be you got to be there and beat all these other guys uh, because they're going to take them all. And you might wonder how an oak ever successfully reproduces. Uh, and this is where a very ancient mutualism comes to the rescue: mutualism between jays and oaks. Uh, it's ancient. It, it uh, they both both those lineages evolved about 56 million years ago in what is now the Arctic, uh, and they right away they got to to like each other. Um, Jays, of course, get those acorns uh, and and use it for winter food. What do jays do for oaks? 
they allow them to move farther and faster than any other tree genus in the world. And this is how that works. So jays are getting, getting those acorns. Okay, I should have showed this earlier. And, and the jays are dispersing the acorns and allowing oaks to move. They store the acorns for winter food. They don't cache them. Um, so they're not putting, they're not piling up in a pile uh, the way squirrels and some other things do. They bury them singly in different places. So they will pick up an acorn, then they'll fly up to a mile. Although I just read the other day, somebody said a mile and a half, whatever it is, it's a long way from the parent tree. Then they land and they find a, usually a disturbed patch of soil and they tap the acorn below the surface of the soil. Uh, and the object is they're gonna go back and get it and have something to eat in the winter time. Now, if they think, that another jay has watched them bury that acorn. They'll wait a few minutes and then they'll dig up their acorn and move it to a different spot because jays know that jays steal acorns. Again, in the wintertime, now they've got their, their winter food. They don't have to rely on other, other uh, seed. They're very busy in the fall. A single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns each fall. But here's the key, they only remember where one out of every four acorns is, which means a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees every single year. It's not just blue jays that are doing that. We've got seven species of jays in this country, maybe eight. Uh, and you of course have the scrub jay uh, in the Pacific Northwest. They have the same relationship with, with acorns. Then we have uh, the acorn woodpecker in the Southwest. It's uh, got a relationship with acorns as well. Um, very specialized relationship. And they're doing pretty much the same thing. They're storing acorns to eat during the winter time, but they don't store them underground. They store them in what we call acorn trees. They find a dead snag and they, they tap out, they carve out uh, little holding cells, and then they put the acorns in the holding cells. Um, now it takes a lot of energy to do that. So they wanna use these trees over and over again. Um, they store their acorn, then they go back in the winter time and, and have something to eat. Uh, so a, a, a single family will protect an acorn tree because it becomes a valuable resource. It can have, it can hold up to 50,000 acorns. And they don't want any other acorn woodpeckers taking them. Uh, so there's a lot of interactions around an acorn tree. It's very entertaining. If you happen to have an acorn tree in your yard, uh, it is a, a very entertaining feature. All right, November is when you might look back and say, well, gee, we had a lot of acorns this year, or we had hardly any. Um, but it's one or the other. The, you, rarely do you have a, a, a intermediate number of, of acorns. When you have a lot, it's called a mast year. Um, and it's a curious way for plants to reproduce. Oaks aren't the only ones that mast, but uh, it still is uncommon, uh, which means there are a number of hypotheses trying to explain why oaks mast. Predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, energy partitioning, those are the top four uh, that you'll find in the literature. Uh, and, and they're not mutually exclusive. They all could be selecting for oak mass at the same time. So let's talk briefly about each one. Predator satiation, this is an acorn weevil outside of the acorn. Uh, again, they can be really common. Up to 90% of the acorns on a tree can have an acorn weevil in it. Um, so if, acorn, if, if, if oaks made the same number of acorns every single year, uh, this population of acorn weevils and acorn moths and squirrels and deer and all the other things that eat acorns would stabilize around that number and they'd eat all the acorns. It'd be very hard for an oak tree to actually reproduce. Uh, but if they make a lot of acorns one year, have a mast year, and then the next year make almost none, the population of acorn eaters builds uh, very high during the, the mast year, and then there's nothing to eat the next year, so it crashes. That's predator reduction, and usually you have several years uh, where there's very few acorns in a row. Then you'll have another mast year, and when you have another mast year, uh, it goes back to predator satiation. There's not enough predators around, acorn predators around, to eat all the acorns. Improved pollination. Oaks are wind pollinated. They drop uh, the catkins down. Those are the male flowers and release a, a lot of pollen on the air. The female flowers are tiny and inconspicuous. These little teeny red things up there. Uh, and uh, an individual oak, the female flowers on an individual oak do not mature at the same time that that particular individual is dropping its pollen. So in other words, oaks cannot self-fertilize. They depend on pollen from another oak that's nearby. So if you have all of your oaks uh, releasing pollen over a, a couple of days, the chances of uh, successful pollination increase. 
And then finally, energy allocation. And by the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, they can. This is a scarlet oak in my yard. Energy allocation, there's never enough energy to go around, so oaks partition it. They'll either use it for growth or they'll use it for reproduction, but rarely do they do a lot of both in one, uh, in one season. So again, those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be working together to explain uh, oak masting. December is when you might recognize another curious uh, trait of, of oaks, particularly members of the, the white oak group, and that is that they don't drop their leaves during, during the winter. This is a deciduous tree, but it holds its leaves all winter long, uh, particularly on younger oaks, uh, and again, particularly in the white oak group. That's a condition called marcescence. Uh, again, unusual, so ecologists tried to explain it. And the leading hypothesis is that it wasn't long ago, eight, 9,000 years ago, when there were a lot of huge Pleistocene mammals uh, around the world, but certainly in, in uh, the temperate zones of North America. This is the number of, of uh, large Pleistocene mammals that were in Mexico alone. Three species of mammoths, giant sloth, they could reach up 18 feet, elk, excuse me, camels. I think the world had 44 species of rhinoceros back then, a lot of big guys. And many of them were browsers, like the white-tailed deer uh, and mule deer today. Browsers means they're not eating grass out there, they're eating uh, woody material, typically buds of uh, trees, of woody plants that are going to you know, pr provide the leaves the following year. That's where the nutrition is. So the thinking is that, that oaks decided to protect their buds by surrounding them with the dead leaves of the previous year. Don't drop those leaves, and then it's very difficult to eat the bud without getting a mouthful of very untasty dead leaves. <clears throat> and if you look at the distribution, of marcescent leaves, uh, it supports that hypothesis because it only goes up about 18 feet, and that's as high as those mammals could meet, could could reach. Uh, it, you know, it's very tough to test that hypothesis today, but it makes a nice story. It also gives oaks a nice uh, landscaping trait that can, um, can be very useful. They can serve as a screen even in uh, the winter time. Uh, very unusual for for a. Uh, a deciduous tree. So if you don't like your neighbor, you can plant a white oak and, and uh, that goes for an Oregon oak as well and screen him out. All right, January uh, is, is a time of year when it's cold and we don't spend a lot of time out staring at our, our oaks. Uh, but if we did, you're probably going to see some tiny little birds flitting around in, in your oak. Uh, now birds don't, you know, it looks like they're playing. They're just jumping around for the fun of it, but they're very energy conscious. Uh, they can't waste energy, so they're they're up there for a reason. And I'm talking about things like uh, chickadees and titmice, um, things like the golden crown, or yeah, the golden crown kinglet. Uh, I took this picture in my in my backyard. It was snowing out there, but the golden crown kinglet there. It's even smaller than a chickadee, and it's flitting around up in the the trees. Well, I'm an entomologist. We all know there's no insects up in the trees during the winter time. Um, so what are they doing up there? Well, uh, oh, by the way, this is called the kinglet paradox because the uh, kinglet doesn't eat seeds at all. Now, the chickadee and the titmice, they come to our feeder and 50% of their diet is seeds in the wintertime. The other 50% is insects and, and spiders. So maybe they are looking for insects up in the trees. But the kinglet uh, it has to eat insects constantly all day long. It should have migrated. It should have migrated down to warmer areas where there are a lot of insects, but it doesn't. Um, so that is called the kinglet paradox. We've got a bird that is living off of insects when there aren't any insects. Well, Bern Heinrich, a wonderful naturalist, he writes a, a uh, he's actually a retired entomologist, but he writes a uh, column in Natural History every month. He does not like paradoxes. So he actually looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets and, and he did it in Maine and he did it in January and he found they were filled with caterpillars. Caterpillars just like this guy, that apparently are up in the trees. They're up in the trees looking just like sticks, which is why we didn't think they were they were up there. Um, and they, they uh, well, they just sit there all winter long. When it gets cold, they've got antifreeze proteins in their cells that keep the cells from bursting. So they shrink a little bit. And then when it gets warmer, they swell a little bit. Uh, but your trees are loaded with, with caterpillars. And that's what the kinglet and the chickadees and the titmice and the other small birds are eating in the wintertime. So we don't have a, a kinglet paradox anymore. They're there for a good reason. There's a lot of food up there, even in the wintertime. What we now have is uh, the question of what are the caterpillars doing in the tree in the wintertime? There really is nothing for them to eat, no green leaves, and they just sit there. 
Uh, well, again, we're not, we don't know for sure, but um, these are uh, not fully grown caterpillars, but almost fully grown caterpillars. And of course, in the springtime, the young oak leaves uh, burst forth. Now, if you overwinter as an egg, as most insects do, when you hatch out, you're a tiny little thing, not competitive with those very big uh, caterpillars. If you overwinter as an adult, which uh, a few uh, moths and butterflies do, then you've got to find a mate, you've got to, got to lay those eggs, and the the eggs have to hatch, uh, and then you're a tiny little guy. So again, the big caterpillar uh, outcompetes you. Um, so it, it seems like there's just a huge competitive advantage for any caterpillar that can make it through the winter. Uh, they've got an unlimited amount of, of food that they can complete their development and then uh, transform into adults. February, this is the quietest time of year for oaks. It's a good time to look at what I call uh, oak landscaping myths. Uh, well, I call them myths, but you know, you typically uh, associated with a myth is, is some degree of fact. So, so we really want to separate fact from fiction here. And I hear this all the time. Oaks are too expensive to, to use. They grow too slowly. I hear people say, you know, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you do plant them, they get too big to use on small lots, uh, and they will fall over and crush your house. They'll lift up your sidewalk. You know, all very, very negative things. Good reasons not to plant oaks. So fact or fiction, let's look at each one of those. Are oaks too expensive to use as landscape trees? Um, well, they can be if you insist on planting a large oak. And of course, nurserymen have figured out that you love planting large trees. So they have figured out how to grow large trees in little old pots, they're called air pots. So they actually can grow them without creating a root bound situation. This is deadly. Never plant a tree that's root bound like this because those roots will continue to grow and strangle the tree and it won't live very long at all. But these root pots, uh, air pots prevent that. But look, it's still a very small amount of root mass compared to the size of the tree in those, those pots, which means when you plant these trees, the first thing they have to do is build a root system appropriate of appropriate size to support the size of the tree that you've planted. So you planted a large tree, but it won't grow after you plant it for a number of years while it's rebuilding that, that root system. So you kind of get instant gratification, but it, then it stalls for a long time. The other option, oh, I ran into this, this uh, planting in Newark, Delaware a couple summers ago. It was at least 10 large oaks that had been planted. Every single one died. That's a lot of money down the drain. So it's risky to plant these large trees. Um, people like to do it anyway. The other option, of course, is bald and burlap, where you actually chop off all the roots, wrap some burlap around it. And then, yeah, of course, it's very hard on the trees. And again, when you plant them, uh, they will just sit there for at least 10 years trying to rebuild their, their root system. If I plant an acorn the same day I plant a tree like this, and I have done this in my yard, uh, in 10 years, that acorn will produce a tree which is larger than the one you spent uh, who knows how much money on, uh, and certainly much healthier because its root system would never be disturbed. Um, <laughs> in 10 years, this is what you're going to get. That's my little joke. That's the angel oak in uh, South Carolina. It's it's a big fella. But this is the the uh, size of the tree that's that's uh, appropriate for planting. Um, most nurserymen don't sell you a tree like this because they can't charge you very much money for it. But you will get a healthier tree that grows uh, much faster than those root prune trees will. Um, so I'm not trying to destroy the the uh, large tree market for for nurserymen. Um, there's a number of, of of situations where that is appropriate. But I'd like to add this market because an awful lot of people will buy oaks when they're small and and cheaper. Um, then they wouldn't buy them if they were huge and and cost thousands of dollars. But if you do plant a small oak, is it going to grow too slowly? Are you really going to be dead before you can enjoy it? Well, that's a good question. And a lot of people would say, yes, that's what happens. So let's have a, a race between the white oak that we're following. This is the one I planted from an acorn in my front yard and my little friend, Bella. She is not my daughter. She is not even my granddaughter, uh, but she was our surrogate granddaughter, uh, which so we, we rented her until we got real uh, grandkids. Uh, and here she is two years old. She was born on my wife's birthday. We saw a lot of Bella when, when she was, was little. And she loved this, this tree. Every time she cried, she'd go out and touch the leaves and, and it would make her happy. Uh, well, this is, again, it's a white oak. You know, it's going to grow really slowly. It's six years old right here, but it's still a very slow grower. So maybe Bella can catch up and pass it. Let's see if she can do that. Here it is at seven years old, eight, nine, 
10, 11, 12, Bella's losing, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 2020. Bella's only 16 years old here, but she's got her mask on us, so we always know it's 2020. Um, she has clearly lost the, the race to uh, our, our white oak that we're following. And Bell is 5'11", so she did, she did the best she could. So I'm going to throw that out. That's a total myth. Oaks do not grow too slowly uh, to use. Um, under the right conditions, they would grow as fast as any other tree, almost. And here's a really important point. Um, they contribute ecologically right away. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves in my yard. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. So it is supporting the food web. It's passing on its energy. Then a bird's gonna come and, and eat this caterpillar right that very first year of its existence. All right, are oaks too large to use in small yards? Well, you're not going to get a landscape architect or a landscape designer to, to spec a large oak for a small yard, but they used to. Um, this is a, a row of uh, a street as I drive into the University of Delaware, a row of, of large red oaks and pin oaks in very tiny yards. And they probably were planted when these houses were built, which is probably more than 100 years ago. Now, remember, 100 years ago, uh, there was no air conditioning. So these trees lowered the temperature of, of these houses by uh, at least 10 degrees all summer long, a very valuable ecosystem service. They have not lifted up the sidewalk. They have not fallen over and crushed the house. But again, nobody's going to, to uh, suggest a tree that big for a yard that small. This is a very large oak uh, in front of a very large church. And fortunately, they didn't cut it down when they, when they built the, the church. Um, so you can find it. So here's a big uh, uh, Gary Oak, Oregon white oak in Portland. Um, it's, a, it's a record tree here in a very small yard. Fortunately, they didn't cut that down. You can find it, but again, nobody's gonna recommend that. Point is, there are some small trees. Um, so not, not so much in, in Washington, uh, but um, in other parts of the world. In the east here, we've got all these species. The yellow highlighted uh, species of small oaks is what you can find just in Texas alone. So there are more options in the west than there are in, in the east. But the dwarf chestnut oak is the go-to oak uh, for landscaping in the east, Quercus prinoides. Um, it's... This is my yard here. It made acorns when it was five feet tall. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not a huge tree. Uh, there are options, there are options. And here's something that uh, you could even try with the Oregon oak, I'm sure. Uh, coppicing. Um, I've never actually seen anybody do this, but you can find uh, coppiced oaks uh, near beaver dams. Uh, and you can find them. I found this picture on online. Coppicing, of course, is when you let the tree get to be uh, two or three, maybe four inches in diameter, cut it off at the base, and it'll come back as a shrub. And you can keep coppicing it. You can do that for 100 years, uh, which gives you the option of having the vegetation of uh, an oak, which is very valuable vegetation ecologically, in a very small yard. I'd like to see more people uh, try to do that. But if we do plant uh, oaks in our yards, are they gonna fall over and crush our houses? Um, well, they can, and it happens. And when it happens, you sure hear about it on the news. You know, the, the, all news people have to sign a contract. They are not allowed to report any good news. You will never hear about the oak that did not fall over and, and crush your house. So it makes it seem like any large tree is gonna fall over. And of course, with the crazy weather we're having, uh, it is happening quite a bit, uh, but, there's a reason it's happening, and, and largely it's because of the way we plant our large trees. We want all of them to be specimen trees, so we, we isolate them from other trees, make sure that they're not competing for nutrients, not competing for, for light or for water, uh, which means their root system cannot interlock with any other tree and give it stability. So you get a lot of wind, you get a lot of rain, and boom, over they go. This is the way trees grow in a forest. They grow close enough together that their roots are interlocked. It forms an extremely stable matrix. Uh, rarely when you have this matrix do you have a blowdown. Here's a stream cut near my house where the soil has been washed away from one, two, three, four trees, showing you how they interlock their, their roots um, extremely stable. So you get the big wind, it might snap them off, but it will not blow them over. And if it's a wind strong enough to snap them off, there's nothing we can do about that. So rather than this, um, I'm suggesting that we, we uh, create what I'm calling 
uh, oak groves or tree groves. They don't all have to be, be oaks. Here are the two white oaks that we got our original acorns from about a mile and a half down the street. That's three feet apart. Nobody planted them. They planted themselves. Uh, and then they put the road in and later. Now, neither one is as, as grand as it would be if it were isolated, but they're both still there, very stable. Um, and there's been a lot of bad weather since they were born. Here are three um, red oaks in Northwest Connecticut. It's called the Three Sisters. So you can go into the woods, you can see this, this situation where you got a lot of big trees very close together. This actually is a planned uh, landscape. This is at Mount Cuba Center in Hokesson, Delaware. Uh, it's one of the DuPont estates dedicated to native plants. So we've got a big red oak in the background. You've got hemlocks in the front, um, large roadies down here. Uh, it, it looks like a natural planting. It is providing wonderful habitat for uh, a lot of creatures, but it is planned. Um, but it's beautiful. You're looking at a, it's, it's, we'll just call it a grove of trees. If you uh, have, you know, two or three acres of, of lawn and you said, well, I want to, you know, I want to reduce that, putting a, a grove of trees in is a wonderful way to do that. It looks natural, it looks beautiful, and it's ecologically very functional. Our oak's going to lift up our, our hardscape. Um, they can, but it depends on what what you plant them over. So this is a large pin oak right next to this, this street here, not lifting it up at all. If you plant your oak over bedrock, the only place the roots can go is laterally. So yes, it'll lift up whatever is next to it. If you plant it over agricultural pan. So agricultural pan is when the, the plow went down about 15, 18 inches uh, for 100 years and all the soil beneath where the plow went got really compacted very hard stuff to, for roots to get through. So roots will go down and hit that pan and then go laterally uh, as well. So if you know your house is, is over uh, an agricultural pan, get the pickaxe out, break it up and the roots will go, will go deep. These are two big red oaks at the University of Delaware, right next to the curb. That's a big tree, not lifting up the curb at all. So when, you, when there's enough soil underneath your tree, um, it's typically something you don't have to worry about. Okay, March. This is when those, those marcescent leaves finally start to drop to the ground and perform their role as leaf litter. Jean Ponzi in, in uh, St. Louis says we should call it leaf largesse. And I think that's a great suggestion because it's not litter. It's really valuable ecological stuff. But before we talk about uh, uh, leaf largesse, let's talk about the variability in oak leaf shape. A lot of people think all oak leaves have, have uh, these lobes, either pointed or, or rounded, uh, and many species do, but some species don't. This is a live oak, this is a willow oak, this is an emery oak in California. I mean, in uh, Arizona, it looks like a holly. This is a water oak, um, shingle oak. So not all of them have, have lobes, so don't let that, that fool you. But there is a tremendous uh, amount of variability in oak leaf shape, and oaks make a lot of leaves. 700,000 leaves on a single large tree. And if you lay them next to each other on the ground, they will cover four tennis courts. And that's their job. It's to cover the ground. The soil community is really important. Uh, it contains all of the detritivores that break down these leaves, returning nutrients to the soil so the tree can use them in future years. Um, it it uh, contains, it houses the mycorrhizae that transfer nutrients to our, our plant roots. But um, all of the creatures that live in the soil depend on high humidity. And that's what the, the oak leaf litter is doing. It's maintaining the, the uh, soil conditions, the high humidity and moisture levels that soil communities require. There are more species that live under the ground than live above the ground. They are all tiny, uh, but again, they're really important. And if you're wondering whether our plants can get through uh, oak leaf litter, they can. This is a, this is a fern. Uh, I'm not going to call it a planting because again, nobody planted it. I just stopped along the road and took this picture. Big white oak, uh, the ferns are coming through just fine. Now, if you pile it up five feet tall, then yes, uh, the, the plants will not be able to get through. But um, a normal layer of leaf litter is, is usually not an impenetrable barrier to many of our favorite plants. Uh, so things like wood, wood poppies, I, I never have time to rake my, my leaves. So um, <laughs> they have to do it alone uh, and they can. Uh, this is native Pachysandra <clears throat> in a leaf litter bed, um, Virginia creeper, lots of examples of plants that will do just fine in, in oak leaf litter. If you look at what's it's living in a single square meter of oak leaf litter, 
a lot of things. 250,000 mites per square meter, 100,000 springtails. This is a little columbolin, uh, smintherid columbolin, um, called springtails. 90,000 proturans, those are primitive insects. You almost need a microscope to see them. A million nematodes, a lot of life under there. And again, they all need, need high humidity. Uh, and then some of the things that, that uh, we enjoy above the ground, like the banded hair streak, uh, beautiful butterfly, its caterpillars eat this stuff, dead oak leaves. So when you rake those oak leaves away, you've thrown away the food for the banded hair streak. You've thrown away that blanket that covers all the soil community. You've exposed the soil to the hot sun, the drying wind, uh, which then will, will start to kill all the things in the, in the soil. Bare soil is an ecological no-no. You've also thrown away all the nutrients that your tree needs in future years. That's one of the major reasons our trees do not live as long as they should, is we don't allow them to fertilize themselves with a nutrient, closed nutrient cycle. Uh, and you're throwing away the food for a lot of species of moths that actually eat um, leaf litter. 70 species of, of uh, we call them uh, litter moths, where the caterpillars are down in the ground eating dead leaves. This is the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, and 67 other species are down there in the leaf litter. When you see a, a white-throated sparrow or a towhee or some of the other birds during the wintertime doing a dance in the leaf litter, what they're doing is kicking it back so they can hunt these uh, caterpillars and, and adult moths and have something to eat all winter long. They can only do that if you leave the leaf litter there. If you rake it all the way, then you've raked away all their food. And of course, the predators that are eating all the things we just talked about, they're there as well. A number of species of ground beetles, um, lightning bugs, fireflies, um, you know, very common in, in most other parts of the country. But I hear all the time, how come I don't see fireflies or lightning bugs the way I, I used to when I was a child? Uh, this is an adult, by the way, and they're not flies and they're not bugs, they're beetles. And this is the... the uh, the lamp, the uh, luminescent organ that they talk sexually to each other with. This is what a, a lightning bug larva looks like. Uh, looks, it's kind of prehistoric in its, its look, but it's a predator in leaf litter. When you throw away your leaf litter, you've thrown away the resource that lightning bugs depend on. So lots of good reasons to keep the leaf litter on our, our properties. April. Um, this is when the uh, buds just start to birth for, burst forward, and it's the time of year when you have a chance to see one of the most ephemeral uh, things that happens in all of biology it takes about five minutes each year. Um, it's pretty common, but you have to be there in the right five minutes to see it. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of your oak, your oak tree. Uh, so that's what's happening here. This is a female cynipid uh, gall wasp. That's her ovipositor, this little, little needle-like structure here. She's injecting an egg into this bud. Um, this is a male cynipid, he is riding her. Uh, and what he's doing is preventing any other male from mating with her. He's already mated with her and she has used his sperm to fertilize the egg that's going into this bud. But after she lays that egg, she's gonna go to another bud and lay another egg. And he wants to make sure that he's the father of that egg. This is a male who wishes he was that male. So here she is, she's laying her egg in the bud. Not only is she injecting the egg into the tree, but she's also injecting plant hormones that will direct the, the growth of the cells in this bud. Uh, these are meristematic cells. They're essentially stem cells. They can go in just about any other direction. So the hormone she's injecting here will direct their growth. But of course, the oak tree has hormones too. And what is the result is this compromise between the battle of the hormones that we call a gall. People call, you know, lichen galls to a cancerous growths on trees. I don't like that analogy because cancerous growths are uncontrolled growth. Uh, galls made by cynipid gall wasps are highly controlled uh, growth. So controlled that you can look at the gall and know exactly which species made that gall because it is species specific. A lot of species of cynipid gall is out there. A thousand species associated with oaks. A single oak tree can have up to 70 species of gallers associated with it. And many of those galls are hollow. Uh, which is another mystery. What are they hollow for? If you cut it open, this is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. I've seen it written both ways. The galler itself is right here in a, a central disc, which is quite hard, a little teeny grub-like thing hiding in there. And then you've got a lot of air and then the outside of the gall. What's that all about? Well, it turns out that cynipid gallers have more natural enemies, more parasitoids, other wasps that develop in cynipids. Uh, and they do that by laying eggs 
right through the gall, injecting eggs into the cynipid uh, larva. This is a pterymid wasp, one of the primary uh, um, enemies of, of cynipids. So the, the uh, distance between the galler itself and the outside of the gall has to be bigger than the length of this ovipositor, otherwise she can reach it. In the beginning, the galls are small and she can reach the interior there and lay her egg. But these grow really quickly and, and outpace the, the distance so that she, the galler is no longer in, in danger. Uh, this is a uh, pterymid from California, has the longest ovipositor that is out there, and that has resulted in the largest uh, gall. This one's very common on Oregon white oak. You can see it uh, wherever you find them. Um, the largest gall we have in the country, and the gallers in the middle there, the, with the uh, it's separated by the distance of that ovipositor to create a safe space for the, the uh, galler. A lot of variation in, in gall size and shape. Um, many of them, well, many of them are, are round, just little round discs on leaves or round discs on stems. Um, some of them look like candy. You in the West have fancier galls than we have in the, in the East. Some look like that. Many of them look like uh, plant diseases, but that's actually a series of galls uh, right in a row here. This is the spindle gall in California, more candy type galls. Um, this is, uh, looks like pottery. This is in my yard the cutest one, the little gnome house gall, that's my name. This is where the galler has emerged, but that's so the gnome can get in there. The brain gall, this is an interesting one. This is a single leaf with four big galls on it, and these are all exit holes. So uh, mature wasps have developed in each one of these galls, and it, you can count the holes and see how many wasps came out. Um, so a single leaf produced, I don't know, a couple hundred uh, uh, gallers, uh, very successful leaf. And there's an interesting bit of, of history associated with galls. If you grind up a stem gall like this and combine it with particular chemicals, it forms an indelible ink. And that is the black ink that our recorded history has been recorded with. Uh, the Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, did his drawings with gall ink. All of the monks and scribes in the Middle Ages, gall ink. Uh, so that's a fun fact you can share at your next cocktail party. Okay, May, uh, the, this is when the biological year really uh, springs forward. Um, those leaves expand. And of course, following leaf expansion, not just of oaks, but of all the deciduous trees in the, the uh, temperate zone comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves come the birds that eat those caterpillars. I'm talking about our migrating birds that time their migration so that they are arriving in uh, North America when there's a lot of caterpillars to eat. Remember, in the springtime, our plants haven't made berries or seeds yet. So these birds are, are insectivorous depending on the insects that are eating expanding leaves. And birders know that the best place to find warblers, migrating warblers, is in oaks because that's where they go to get those insects. I had a uh, student, Christy Beal, several years ago that measured the amount of uh, foraging time of warblers in trees from different tree families in cemeteries. So this first bar here is uh, Fagaceae. That's where the oaks are. The oaks, the chestnuts, and uh, beaches but in her sample size, the only uh, Fagaceae were, were oaks. There were no chestnuts and beeches, pines, birches, and so on. So look, this is where the, the warblers are going because that's where the food is. Uh, and by food, I'm talking about caterpillars. I'm talking about things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher. The lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panopoda, uh, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug. These are called slug caterpillars because their head is tucked up underneath, not because they're really slugs. The streak dagger moth, the, ep the yeah, epilated dagger moth, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and this is my favorite, the spun glass slug, looks like spun glass, and literally hundreds more species of caterpillars are associated with oaks. No wonder the warblers go there. They are loaded with food. And I've been counting the number of caterpillars that are now making a living on my property. We put a lot of plants back, 
Uh, it's, I've been doing this for the last five years, taking pictures of each one, and I'm up to 1,199 species of moths that occur in my yard because we put the plants back. Here's the stat though, 28% of them use oaks. And oaks are only 1.5% of the diversity of plants we put back in our yard, diversity of woody plants, which means they're really important trees in terms of supporting all of this diversity. And because so many of those caterpillars that oaks make are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not flew by, but bred. So that's why I call oaks keystone uh, species. Remember what a keystone is, it's a stone in the middle of the arch. And when you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, a keystone plant is, is um, important in local food webs because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those, those food webs. And oaks are the best keystone plant in 84% of the counties in which they occur throughout North America. They support over 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. There's no other plant uh, genus that comes close to that. Critically important plants in terms of supplying energy to local food webs. Why do I keep talking about caterpillars? I talk about caterpillars because they're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Most animals, most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates and most of the invertebrates are caterpillars. If we produce landscapes that don't make a lot of caterpillars, we have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And don't forget the birds that do not migrate, the residents uh, in our, our yards, things like uh, chickadees and tip mice and all those other things that we talked about. It takes thousands of caterpillars for them to reproduce correctly. Uh, no, reproduce successfully. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars for a Carolina chickadee to get one clutch of babies to the point where they fledge, where they leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. This figure varies because of the number of chicks in the nest, but you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make a bird that's a third of an ounce. It is not unusual. All the birds are eating thousands of caterpillars. What's gonna make those caterpillars? Oaks will lead the way. Okay, June. This is, uh, I call this cicada month. We had the emergence of the periodical cicada last year and I know you don't have that, uh, so I won't dwell on it, but um, it's an interesting interesting period of, of our, uh, E ecological history, at least once every 17 years, is also a 13-year brood. So it's very predictable. Uh, this is, this is uh, they'll come out uh, within a, a week of each other, uh, which means the media knew it was going to happen, which means they had plenty of time to help vilify nature. Uh, you should have heard the, the radio and talk show people in the East here just before the cicadas came. Uh, it was going to be a terrible scourge. They were going to be so, so loud that uh, mothers would go crazy and kill their babies. You should consider moving so you don't have to endure it. It'll be uh, an invasion. Um, I heard all these things and they were actually serious when they said them. None of that's true, of course. It was one of the most fantastic biological events that you'll ever be privileged to, to witness. It was a big one uh, this year. These are the shed skins, the exuvii of the, the uh, cicadas after they come out of the ground. When they come out of the ground, they leave a hole which aerates the soil, allows moisture and oxygen to get down to the roots, very valuable ecosystem service. Again, there were a lot of them uh, in, in Newark, Delaware. So many that 11 Mississippi kites flew up from who knows where and stayed for two weeks eating our, our cicadas. Uh, so good for birders as well. Briefly, here's the life cycle. They crawl out at night uh, and hang from a branch upside down, split their skin, then swing up. And what they're trying to do is, is tan their exoskeleton, uh, harden it up so that, because um, right now they're, they're like a uh, soft shell crab, very easy, very vulnerable. This is why they do it at night. After a few hours, they're all hardened, ready to go, which means they can fly off and start uh, what they're here for. And that is to mate and lay eggs. Uh, so this is a male, the male will sing, by vibrating a couple of membranes in its thorax. Uh, it's, it's like a, a Coke can that's clicking. If you squeeze the Coke can, click, 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 click. These guys do that to those membranes, but they do it about 400 times a second. So it creates this buzz. He is loud because he wants to get, uh, he wants to attract a female. Females go to the loudest male because it's a good measure of how healthy that male is. He was successful. He attracted a male. 
a female. Uh, they made it. And now it's her turn. She's going to lay eggs. This is a pin oak in my front yard by jamming her ovipositor into the twig. Take a pin and try to jam it into the, the uh, twig of an oak. You're going to bend the pin. It's really hard to do. But she can do it. She gets it in there all the way. Then she lays an egg. Then she lays another egg, about seven right in a row uh, in descending uh, order there. Then she'll go to another branch and do the same thing. And from the point where those eggs are laid out, the branch often dies. That's called flagging. Again, people get upset. Say so the cicada is going to kill my tree. It's not going to kill your tree. It is going to prune your tree once every 17 years. It'll be okay. Then the eggs hatch. Little guys fall to the ground. I used to say they parachute to the ground. And somebody said, where do they get the parachutes? They don't really use a parachute. Uh, they hit the ground, then they tunnel underground, and then they, they develop on the xylem of roots. Now, xylem is, is just about, um, there's almost no nutrition in it at all. It's water. Um, so they essentially grow on water for 17 years. That's one of the reasons they grow so slowly. Uh, and they you can have up to 50,000 nymphs on a single tree sucking on the xylem of the roots without any measurable effect on the growth of the tree. They do like oaks better than other trees. I had a student looking at where you had the most flagging uh, in, in Newark, Delaware, and the green bars are all different types of oaks. So they hit other trees, but they prefer the oaks. And then they die. Takes about three weeks. That's it for 17 years. Why do they stay underground for 17 years? Well, it's probably that predator satiation again. Um, there's no predator that can wait 17 years in between meals. Uh, so things like squirrels and birds do eat a lot of these guys, but there's never enough squirrels and birds around to handle all the cicadas that come out at once. July, this is when the night chorus begins. Um, by night chorus, I'm talking about katydids. Um, this is a male katydid. It will raise its four wings and, and uh, move them back and forth across each other. There's a scraper and a file on there, and it makes it a... Uh, characteristic Katie did sound. And if you're wondering why males are making this sound, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night. And each summer they solved the mystery by singing Katie did, Katie did. I grew up in, in uh, New Jersey, did a lot of camping in North Jersey, and Katie did sang me to sleep uh, many a night. I love that sound. Um, there are four species of Katie dids that frequent oak forests in the east, only one in, in the west. Uh, so we get to enjoy them more than, more than you do. This is a female uh, that is uh, almost mature. She hasn't expanded her wings yet, but there's her ovipositor ready to go. Um, so why are they, uh, the, there she is, she's expanded her, her wings. Why are the males so loud? It's the same reason that the cicadas are, are loud. They are trying to attract a female. Females go to the loudest male because it is a signal of fitness. Uh, they lay their eggs, glue them to stems along branches. They're very large. These guys have already hatched, but people find them and wonder what they are. They are katydid eggs. Okay, August. So katydids come out, uh, at, at least at my house, in mid-July. They'll sing right through July, right through August, and into September, and then fade out as it starts to get, get cold. August is a time when oak leaves get really, really tough. Uh, and that's a, it's a defense against the things that eat oak leaves. In the spring, of course, they're tender. Lots of things can eat young oak leaves. Um, it's a wonderful source of nutrition. But by August, uh, they're kind of like boards. They're loaded with tannins and lignans, very, very tough. But of course, insects have adapted to that toughness. And one of the ways you can get around that is to feed gregariously. Everybody eats together. You put all those little mouths together and it's easier to get through that tough leaf material. This is the yellow net caterpillar. Here it is um, when it's almost full grown. They do consume quite a bit of material. But gregarious behavior is common. The orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. So many of the things that eat oaks in August are gregarious. I walked around, this is the oak we're following in 2014, and I counted the uh, number of caterpillars that were just on the lower branches. Uh, and I did it uh, at the, the end of July, almost August. Uh, I got 410 caterpillars, including 115 yellow net caterpillars on this, this tree. And I just stood back and took this picture so I can ask you, do you see any of those caterpillars? No, you don't. Do you see any caterpillar damage? No, you don't. It's there 
but the distance at which we view our trees prevents us from, from getting upset about all these caterpillars on our tree. But if I knocked on your door and said, you got, you got 410 caterpillars on the lower part of your oak, most people would, would freak out. Get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks are really good at passing on part of the energy they, they uh, sequestered from the sun so that you have living things in your yard. If you have no holes in any of your plant leaves, uh, you have no life in your yard because that means your plants have not uh, passed on the sun's energy. I met a woman, Tammany Baumgarten in uh, New Orleans several years ago, and she suggests that we all practice the 10 step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all your insect problems disappear. And I think that's wonderful advice. Another way to get around leaf toughness in August is to become a leaf miner. Only eat the center of the leaves. The toughness is in the, the outer epidermis here. Uh, and a number of caterpillars have done that. Uh, you can do that by being really, really small. So here the egg was laid this, and this guy made a serpentine mine. He, he mined the center of the leaf all the way here, kind of looked like a snake. The black area is, that's his poops, his frass. Pushes it all to the center, then he pupated here, and that's all the oak material he's going to eat uh, in the entire uh, his entire life history. Here's a blotch leaf mine. There's the caterpillar in there going in a circle. Here it is backlit. Here it is, a really good picture from Salvador Batanza. Um, doesn't look much like a caterpillar, but that's because it's got all those adaptations for being a leaf miner. But when it comes out as an adult, it does look like uh, a, a little moth. They are tiny. This is one of the Camomaria species. Solitary oak leaf miner, gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner. A lot of leaf miners on oaks because that's a good way to get around that leaf toughness. Okay, September, our last month. Um, this, of course, is when you're going to run into crickets uh, more than any other time of the year, those black guys that are on the ground. If a cricket gets in your house, by the way, and sings, it's good luck, so make sure you don't kill them. But there are also crickets up on our vegetation called tree and bush crickets. They're not black. They're usually yellowish or greenish, uh, and um, they are up on our, our oak leaves as well, doing the same thing that the cicadas and the, the katydids are doing. The males are singing, trying to attract females and they wanna sing as loud as they can so that the female chooses them. These guys are really smart about it though. They find a hole in the leaf or they chew a hole in the leaf of the appropriate size. They stick their head through there, raise their wings, move them back and forth and make their little cricket sounds. Uh, now most oak uh, leaves, most leaves in general have a slight parabolic shape to them. So when they sing in a hole like this, it projects the sound farther and louder than if they sang on a flat surface. Uh, so believe it or not, they're sending a false message to the female. They're saying, I'm bigger than, than I really am. If you can believe a male would send a female a false message. She falls for it. She comes and she, she mates with him. And you think, oh dear, she's, she's picked a, a bad guy. Uh, well, he may not be the biggest male, but he might be the smartest male. So it might be okay. It's also a good time to find walking sticks. Uh, this is a walking stick on an emery oak in, in Arizona because uh, in, in uh, September, they've been up in the canopy all, all season long, but they tend to come down in, in the fall. Um, they're called walking sticks because they look like sticks and, and they walk, but they have a curious reproductive behavior. They just walk around in the, in the canopy and drop eggs to the floor, to the forest floor. Some of those eggs hatch uh, that year, some hatch the following year, some hatch even two years later. It's a bet hedging strategy uh, so that they distribute their reproduction over time and space. Uh, this is the species that's that's common at, at uh, our house. You don't see them that that often, but here's an interesting relationship. This is uh, one of the spring ephemerals, blood blood root, which like many spring ephemerals make pods, and inside those pods are the seeds cute little things, and they have these white structures associated with them. Those white structures are called aliasomes, uh, and it's a mechanism to get ants to take them back to the nest. Ants love aliasomes, so they take, pick up a seed, they carry it back to the nest, they all eat the aliasome. The seed is too hard to eat, so they throw it in the garbage dump of the ant nest, which is a perfect place. It's about an inch below the surface of the soil. It's a perfect place for this seed to germinate. Well, these are walking stick eggs that have a white strip, just like an eliasome. And I'll bet there's some chemistry, uh, chemical mimicry going on here because the ants think they're, they're uh, spring ephemeral seeds. They pick them up, they take them back to the nest. They can't eat them. So they throw them in the garbage dump and the walking sticks get to hatch in safety. All right, we've made it through the year. 
Um, let's end uh, the way we, we, we started, talking about the biodiversity crisis that we've created on planet Earth. You know, we got two, two problems. We've got climate change and we've got a biodiversity crisis. And if we had no climate change, we would still have a biodiversity crisis because we are not sharing our spaces. We talk about things disappearing, like a three billion birds have, have uh, disappeared since 1970. They haven't disappeared. We've killed them. We're killing our birds. We're killing our insects. We're killing nature. And that is why we are now in the sixth great extinction event. There's no mystery about it. So it's a global crisis. The good news is it's got a grassroots solution. It's one that all of us, you and me, we all can address and actually make a difference. Um, why is that? Well, there are four things that every single landscape has to do today. It's got to capture carbon. It's got to manage the watershed in which it lies. It's got to support a diverse community of pollinators not because they're pollinating air crops, but because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. And it's got to support a complex food web. When you plant an oak, you're addressing all four of those ecological goals. You're capturing more carbon than other trees. You're managing the watershed with that huge root system. You're supporting a more complex food web than any other plant. You're even supporting a diverse community of pollinators. Uh, even though oaks are wind pollinated, watch those catkins in the spring. The bees will come in, they'll gather the, the pollen from the, the, uh, the catkins. Now they're not moving them to the female flowers, so they're not actually pollinating, but they are using oak pollen. Despite all of these wonderful landscape attributes, oaks are in trouble these days, as so many things are. The old giants are gone from our, our uh, forests. Um, they were cut down for agriculture um, uh, or simply for their for the valuable uh, wood that they they contain. The percentage of oaks in our eastern forests has been cut in half in the last hundred years because we've introduced so many problems. We have done the the uh, high grade uh, uh, logging, but we've also introduced the gypsy moth, which is now the uh, spongy moth, the winter moth, a number of diseases, sudden oak death syndrome in the west, oak oak wilt and oak bacterial leaf scorch in the east. Deer overabundance everywhere is is really hammering our oaks because every baby oak that pops up is eaten by a, a deer. And then we've got habitat fragmentation, which is separating our oaks so much that the pollen doesn't reach from one tree to another. And you put all those things together, 28% of our 91 North American oak species are now threatened. One third of global oaks are endangered for the same reasons. The Oregon white oak has lost 97% uh, of its range. It used to occur from Southern California all the way up through Washington. And of course it grew where we, uh, we have agriculture. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. Now we humans live our lives out in a very brief instant of ecological time and we cannot return those huge oaks to the forest in that time period, but we can start the process. Uh, and you'd be surprised in no time at all, the oaks will get big enough that we plant today uh, to assume many uh, and sometimes all of their keystone positions in our yards, in our natural areas. Now, we're all responsible for good earth stewardship, every single one of us, because we all require good earth stewardship. We all require healthy ecosystems. And the best way to exercise our responsibility is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of our turkeys, our chickadees, our woodpeckers, our warblers, our jays, our thrushes, our lightning bugs, our gallers, our weevils, our orthopterans, our moths, for our own sake, for our own sake. Plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. Doug, thank you so much. That was really inspiring. And just like your book, it's like you want to hold on to all those little bits of information to be able to regurgitate them to anyone who will listen. So thank you. Is <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anybody have a question that you want to pass on to Deb? I'm going to um, go ahead and open the q and I see a couple there. So let's see. Kurt has asked us a question. Thank you, Doug. You are an inspiration. Do you have tips for beginners looking for caterpillars? Mm -hmm. I feel like I would go to the lower branches of your oak and find zero out of 400. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you do have to develop what we call a search image. In other words, you got to know what they look like. Get used to seeing them. The caterpillars don't want you to find them. They're hiding from the birds. So the very best way, the, the best tip I have is to go out at night when they're not hiding for birds. They come right, right out on the leaves and they eat in the open. Go out with a flashlight and shine it up in the leaves. That's a great way to find them. But otherwise, uh, make sure you look on the underside of the leaf. The only caterpillars that are on the top of the leaf are the ones that taste bad. And there's far fewer of those than the ones that taste good. A lot of them will crawl off the, the leaves altogether onto the branches of the trunk and sometimes even off the tree during the day. And then they come back at night. So nights is, is my best uh, suggestion. And also look at the right time of year. Don't look in the spring when the birds are, are feeding their young. They have gotten them all. I mean, they are so good at finding those caterpillars. Best time is after the, the babies have fledged and the population starts to rebound a little bit. Maybe uh, the end of July, early August is a good time to look. Excellent, thank you. Um, this next one is from Burton and Sarah Williams. Let's see if I've got the, oh no, wait, I'm sorry. Lee Weinstein, Weinstein, wonderful presentation. I'm looking out at several hundred acres of oaks on North Slopes, the east side of Mount Hood and the Cascades. On the drier side of Oregon, where there's lots of wind, dry grass, other other fuels. Is there anything in particular we can do for these oaks? There have been more wildfires out here. How will they do in those? Well, oaks are actually a fire climax species or, or, or genus um, because fire suppresses the growth of some of the other competitive uh, woody plants. That's another reason that we've lost many oaks in the east is we've suppressed fire entirely and things like maples and cherries have, have come up and replaced them. Um, so oaks are good at handling ground fires. Nothing's good at handling a crown fire. Um, so controlled burns is a great way to encourage oaks. But, you know, I, I hear about this in California all the time. People say we got to cut down all the plants near our house because fire is going to burn the house. But it turns out that particularly the live oaks are really good at blocking and intercepting those flying embers when you do have a crown fire. So if your house is surrounded by oaks, uh, it's actually a protective barrier. It takes a lot to get an oak, uh, particularly a live oak going. Um, so it, it could be a preventive measure rather than, than something you have to remove. Thank you for that. Um, those coppice oaks that you were talking about, oaks that have been either cut or burned or somehow damaged at the in the canopy, in the crowns, um, when they sprout back, have you seen them emerge from that state? Do they eventually develop a leader or do all the stems establish? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, eventually they will develop a leader, but it can take years. Um, you know, oaks are not the only trees you can coppice. Cherries, a lot of things do that. They used to, the settlers used to coppice all the time to get small uh, woody material to make baskets and other things. We don't do it anymore, but um, yes, you have to do it once in a while because it will develop a leader uh, and then it'll, it'll stay in bush form. And that was, sorry, a question from Burton and Sarah Williams. And we see that that uh, response to disturbance frequently where we live because of um, the prevalence of fire and um, a lot of our oaks have adapted that strategy. Uh, Mallory Pratt is asking, what is your view on planting oaks from a variety of places, mostly non-native for us in the Pacific Northwest in our urban landscape as a strategy to increase climate resilience of our urban tree canopy? Hmm. Uh, I have a dimmer view of it than most other people. Uh, you know, I, I think we can address climate change. I know we can address climate change and biodiversity at the same time. When we start planting trees from other places, we're addressing climate change and skipping the, the biodiversity crisis. So that, that's just unnecessary. We actually did a study last, I guess it was two years ago, comparing the, uh, the insects supported by red oaks planted in Portland, Oregon versus red oaks planted in the east here. Uh, and huge difference. Almost nothing will eat the red oaks in Portland. Same tree, but that's because we have moved it, you know, 3,000 miles from the creatures that depend on it. So uh, yeah, it grows and it sequesters carbon, but so does your Oregon white oak. Why wouldn't you stick with the, the trees that belong there that, that other things are adapted to eating? And then you can support biodiversity and the birds and everything else at the same time. That's my view of it. Okay, so Janet Gifford has observed our urban landscape in Portland contains two giant Oregon white oaks. The arborist observed lace bug damage and now applies a systemic twice annually for control. 
<laughs> in your opinion, does this treatment negatively affect bird foraging or other aspects of oak health? Of course it does. It kills everything on that. Side. Um, the only thing it supports is your arborist. <laughs> Oaks everywhere have the oak uh, lace bug. There's a couple species of them. It's a normal component of your, your oak trees. They don't need it. Um, be those systemic insecticides kill all the caterpillars on it. You've just taken a wonderful tree and made it useless. And those systemics last for years too. So um, yeah, totally against that. <laughs> 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 uh, Kathy Pendergrass has just observed. Thank you so much. We wish we had one of you in the West to do more research over here. <laughs> I got grandkids in Portland, and so I go out there once in a while. <laughs> oh, don't tell us that. We might <laughs> try to rope you in. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you hear me, Donna? Yes. Um, I was. Uh... <laughs> driving through coastal South Carolina once and there was some new development going in and it looked to me like there were fences around a lot of the oak trees there that were in the development area and it just made me think although I haven't looked into it that they may have some zoning ordinances that really were great in protecting oaks and I was just curious if you're aware of any models for zoning that actually uh, does protect oaks in that way. Uh, you know what I think that was, it was, I bet it was a farm that was converted into a development uh, because a lot of, a lot of farmers will put fences around their oaks so that the cows don't rub them uh, because they like the shade. They want to want to protect the oaks. And I bet people just hadn't taken the fences down. I've never seen a developer actually do that. Um, so I don't think there's any ordinances that way. Anybody I might else? be wrong about that. But. Sue. Can you address the homegrown national parks idea? You know or, what? If you, let, maybe he already did. if you let me screen share, I will I will address it properly. I was running late, so I didn't. Um so. Oh, come on. All right. Homegrown National Park. This is our, our uh, small nonprofit um, that we have created. You know, people tell me all the time that you only talk to the choir. And I say, well, that's because it's only the choir that invites me. <laughs> but it's <laughs> we have to get we have to get this message to the non-choir. If it's a if it's a grassroots solution, it means everybody is responsible for this. Uh, and most people don't have a clue that that we have a biodiversity crisis. So how do we reach those people? This was one idea was to um, try to get the message to go viral using, using this website, using the nonprofit, social media. Um, what you do is you join Homegrown National Park. It's free. You register your property, register your property uh, and the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. If you actually have lawn, you reduce the area, then, then you're going to put that on the map. If you plant your oak tree, how much area is that, that covering? Um, and then your area of, of your county is going to light up. And the object is to get the entire country to light up. We're asking people to reduce the area in lawn. Lawn doesn't do anything ecologically uh, productive. Replace that lawn with more natives. Remove any invasives that are on your property. Most people do have invasive plants on their property. A lot of people have protected areas uh, on their property, so make sure you keep protecting them. The ecological product of Homegrown National Park is that it will significantly increase biodiversity. Ton of biodiversity here that wouldn't be there if it was lawn. And all these plants significantly draw down uh, atmospheric CO2. So every time we put a plant uh, in, in the ground, we are helping with climate change. It's also going to build connections between existing preserves, creating biological corridors, and that's a good thing as well. But we have a sociological product as well, and that's national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are. We want to change our culture, change our, our uh, you know, right now we have an adversarial uh, relationship with nature. We want to make it a cooperative uh, or a collaborative relationship with nature. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional and that everybody owns a responsibility to sustaining it. Everybody, not just tree huggers. 
And the map will provide measurable progress towards the UN's 3030 initiative. We're going to save 30% of the earth by 2030, not unless we record conservation on private property. The benefits of a homegrown national park is that it converts hope into action. It get, gives you something to do instead of just, just worrying about it. We don't rely on governmental support. We would love governmental support, but we don't need it to exist. And it merges all the existing conservation efforts, Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, your backyard uh, certified habitats. We wanna put them all together on, on these maps to make one aspirational visual of how well we're doing in conservation on private property. So that's the homegrown national park story. Thank you, it's inspiring. Um, anyone else in the room have questions? There's a few more in the chat here. Adam? I was gonna ask, Doug, he has such encyclopedic knowledge on, on folks. I'm wondering if it spans into the realm of the mycorrhizal fungi association and what we know about our oak trees and our Underground Not much. <clears throat> um, yeah, oaks have, uh, they have mycorrhizal uh, associations. Um, there's a number of species. And of course, mycorrhizae uh, are fungi that wrap around the root hairs of, of many plants, including oaks. <clears throat> Truffles are, are mycorrhizae, and they transfer nutrients from the soil to the tree, and they take uh, carbohydrates from the tree. So it's a mutualistic relationship. Um, a lot of people think that uh, if you plant an oak, but you don't have the mycorrhizae, it's not going to live at all. That's probably not true, because first of all, mycorrhizal spores are floating on the air, and they do inoculate soil all the time. You can speed up the process though. If you, let's say you're gonna plant a, a, a Oregon white oak and you have an acorn, you plant it, go to an existing one in a natural area and scoop up some of the, the humus, the soil underneath that tree. Doesn't have to be much, you're inoculating the soil. And then you take it to your new planting and put it there. And you've, that's it, you've done it, you've inoculated it uh, with appropriate mycorrhizae. Um, so that's all I know. <laughs> Anybody else in the room? I'm curious about oak pit scale. Can you talk a little bit about that? There are a number of scales that uh, like oaks, um, both soft scales and hard scales, two different families, coxidae and diaspidity. Uh, I don't know anything in particular about oak pit scale. <laughs> I'm kind of curious about like the ecological function of them. Are they just- You know, it's an insect. It's a it's a homopteran that, that is trying to make a living like everything else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I do get the question frequently, what good is this particular species? Um, it, it's a tough question to ask or to answer, uh, or, or it's an easy question to answer. Ecosystems function better when they have more species in them. And as species diversity increases, the productivity and stability of the ecosystem increases as well. And as you take species away from an ecosystem, it becomes more unstable and less productive, meaning it's making less uh, life support for us. Um, so the scales, the aphids, all the things we consider bad, they're all part of the system. They're one of those species uh, and we should view it in, the, in its entirety rather than picking apart individual species, say, well, what good is that particular one? Often we don't find out what good it was until we take it out. And then, <laughs> so. All right, we have another question in here. Um, Burton is asking a follow-up question. We have 20 acres of land, which is primarily covered in Oregon white oak. The largest oaks are at the bottom of our only south-facing slope. What could this be due to? probably moisture. Um, the water's going to run downhill. <clears throat> so when I say oaks grow pretty quickly, I really am talking about eastern oaks that get a lot of rain. And the, the, the you know, as you start to uh, reduce the amount of rainfall, they do grow more slowly. Um, and that is certainly true about, about some of your western oaks. Uh, so wherever you have more moisture, they are going to grow larger and faster. All right, and Marianne Nelson is asking, how do we train urban foresters not to require large caliper trees and tree banks? In Portland, I wanted a Gary Oak and they wanted a three inch caliper. Luckily, I could only find a one and a half inch and was allowed to plant it. <laughs> That's just misinformation. Um, 
I, you know, I, I it's, it's city officials, not just, just foresters, but um, they do have some reasons. For example, in areas where you get a lot of snow, they say, well, the snow plow is going to knock down a small one. Uh, or, or the, you know, anybody who's mowing around there just goes over it. It's easier to kill a tiny tree. So they want to start with a big one that they say will have better survivorship. Uh, but there's a lot of data showing the big trees have very, pretty low survivorship um, unless everything goes right. And they are much more expensive. So I, I keep saying, please plant smaller trees, spend a little bit protecting them in the beginning. But you will be happy later on because it didn't cost very much and you're going to have much higher survivorship and a healthier tree. Um, so it's just that's that's, you know, differences of opinion. And it would probably take somebody to really study it to convince them. But. Excellent. All right. Anonymous attendee. <laughs> so thank you for a great presentation. I had a forester tell me that a large dying oak has cancer. I'd <laughs> never heard that trees can get cancer. It was pretty deformed. Can you shed any light on this? You've never heard that they get cancer because they do not get cancer. <laughs> um, okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, a typical, one of the stages in an oak's life is to get hollow parts in parts of the tree. And whenever a, a, a forester or an arborist sees that, it's a, it's a great argument to to start to take down the tree or spend a lot of money treating it or whatever and they tell you it's going to be much weaker um, but somebody explained to me you know look at a pipe a pipe is hollow but it's really strong and that's what a hollow tree is the living part of the tree is not the dead center that's just dead xylem even when it's not hollow that's not where the strength is the strength is in the cambium in the living part of the tree and it circles the tree um, so a uh, an old oak almost always has hollow parts in the middle. That's where the, the black bears overwinter in those big hollow parts. So just the fact that there's a hollow part in your tree does not mean it has cancer or that has to come down. If you don't want to take any risks at all and the house the tree is right next to your house, okay, I get that. But there's a lot of trees that we should leave alone because those hollow centers are um, really important ecological additions to your, your landscape. And it's normal. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Ethan. Um, so I was wondering, uh, we, we've got sudden uh, sudden oak death in you know California and Southern Oregon, and we don't yet have it in our area. Um, I'm wondering how big of a concern that is for our oak species, if we could speak to that, and if there's any steps we could be taking that you know of to keep that out of our area. Uh, well, you know, it, it's moved by by nursery stock. There's a lot of plants that carry sudden oak death syndrome. Um, and, and I think, uh, well, a lot of plants do. So moving this nursery stock up and down the coast is gonna move it around. Um, it doesn't attack all the oaks. I think it's really hard on coastal live oak and, and some other species. Uh, and, and again, the suggestion is you know, stop planting oaks because they're gonna get one of these diseases. I say just the opposite. We wanna plant as many as possible because there is resistance to sudden oak death, there's resistance to oak leaf scorch, there's a resistance to oak wilt, but we have to get it to, we have to find the trees that are resistant and, and promote them. They're the ones that are gonna produce acorns and drop them. So the blue jays and the, the scrub jays will help us spread those resistant trees. But if we stop planting trees because a disease might come, we will never find the resistance uh, and then we'll lose these extremely valuable trees. We cannot lose oaks from our, our ecosystems. How do you keep it out of your area is to st stop moving plants from infected areas. Uh, that, but you know, you can't see it, so it's tough. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that is a nice segue into the next question, which is what do you think about assisted migration of oak species to suitable climates in the face of climate change? Yeah, I don't think much about that either uh, because we don't have gradual slow climate change. What we have is climate change that expresses itself in extreme climate variability. So we have we have spikes of heat, we have spikes of cold, we have a lot of rain, we have a lot of drought. It's you know going like this. Uh, and so for example, remember two two years ago, uh, there was that that freeze that went from Canada all the way down into Mexico, right through Texas. It was so cold down in, in Texas, it killed native plants that they hadn't seen in, in years and years. So when we start moving plants north, because it's going to be mild and, and, and nice for them, you get one of these polar vortexes, which are happening uh, more and more because the, 
the uh, jet stream is loose now and it and it dips when it didn't used to dip, then we're going to lose those those plants. I think it's much better. And also, if you move plants away from their community that uses those plants, you've reduced their their value. It's much better to let the plants in their normal um, geographic distribution. We want them to adapt to these changes. That's the goal. How do they do that with as much genetic variability as possible? It's one of the arguments against using cultivars because they have zero genetic variability. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's asking a lot of our, our plants because the climate is changing faster than the generation of our, our trees. Um, but moving them around, I don't think is gonna, that's not gonna be the solution. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, here we've got one. Oh, no, just an appreciation. Thank you, Doug, <laughs> for this presentation and uh, your great work that inspires people to love oaks. I couldn't agree more with that observation. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? You know, people, people say I know a lot about oaks. The way you learn about anything is to write a book about it. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> to Everybody be accountable. Will tell you. <laughs> We're going to tell you all the things you left out, and that's how you learn about that. <laughs> that's a good a good methodology. <laughs> we'll get busy on that. Dustin, did you have a question? I did. It's not pertaining uh, to this book. Uh, how can we access or obtain any uh, additional information that, that we can look at? How do we get connected with other of your resources, so any of your papers or books? Go to homegrownnationalpark.org. It's all on that website. All right. Good plug. <laughs> That's where it is. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Well, Doug, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. It's just invaluable. Thanks for the invitation. All right. Take care.